Hello everyone, I'm D-Mind, the mind of one and all, and welcome back to another episode of An Octave Higher. So, in the last episode, well, we went back to this girl. We actually shift perspective quite frequently. And now we're back to this girl in the factory working. I guess this MM, making machines. Yeah. This factory produces tons of machinery, literally tons every day. Oh wait, I read this stuff already. We make chassis for various kinds of machinery and assemble components from other sections into these chassis to produce final products. Meanwhile, engines like the mana absorption engine and the magic casting engine are made elsewhere and brought here for the final assembly. You know, I would imagine the final assembly is the most exciting part because you actually see all the parts as you put it together to make the final machinery. Oh well. But hey, even working on the not boring stuff still mostly involves casting the same magic all day every day. So how exciting can it be? That's just how work in the factory is. You come in the morning, drink a bottle of mana, use it all up by casting the same magic until lunch, then you gulp down another bottle of mana after lunch, and continue casting that exact same magic again until the end of the shift at sundown. And that's basically my life in a nutshell. Mine and everyone else's. I'm back at my poor huge empty furnace, looms in front of me. Silent, I start to focus on courage. So at least did the boss give it to you? Had to use my feminine charm, but yes, he did. Oh, something's happening. A clanging sound from the furnace calls my attention. I see that the furnace is now filled with chunks of metal. I think they are aluminium, or is it zinc? that have been dropped by a machine on the upper floor straight into the furnace. I reach out with one hand. Summon Courage. Summon. A fire bursts inside the furnace and the, fire and the chunks of metal are quickly swallowed by the flames. Did he take it out of your wages? I hope not. He didn't mention anything. Do they usually do that? If they like you, usually not the first time, but just don't make it a habit. I know. A minute later, the the metal has turned completely into burning liquid. A small door at the side of the furnace opens, and the liquid streams down through a pipe that distributes it to several different shaped molds. One of the molds is right beside Jude, who has just finished gathering courage in her hand. Once her mold is full with hot metallic liquid, she places her hand a few inches above it. Nullify. Oh yeah, so I realized courage is heat. But if you nullify here, you get the opposite reaction. It's not making it less heat hot, it's making it cold. So that's how you make it cold. So I guess that's how it makes sense for the ice and to cool it off. Nullify courage. Jude casts a spell and heat starts gradually leaving the liquid, slowly transforming the molten metal into a solid chassis part. At the same time, more chunks of metal are being deposited into the my furnace and summon courage. I cast fire again. You know, my parents used to say that I have great talents in magic. They said I could become a mage. Too bad nowadays a magician can only become a mage if she graduates from magic school. Well, you might never be a mage, but you are talented. Look at you handling that gigantic furnace while the rest of us have these molds. Yeah, maybe, but I have a feeling that my parents didn't imagine me melting melt melting metal for a living when they hit that. Uh, the metal in Jude's mold has completely cooled. It's ready to be used for the final assembly form of a machine. She takes the chassis part out of the mold and puts it on a conveyor belt nearby, which will deliver it to a mechanical system to be assembled together with other parts and engines. Soon another new machine will have been produced. The pre-configured mechanical system is made out of gears, belts, roller chain, and a bunch of other things whose name I don't know. The whole thing can be operated simply by rotating the first gear which is kept in motion by another worker who continually casts wind on it throughout the day. Uh huh, I guess they wouldn't have. All parents say this kind of thing about their kids, don't they? They're all like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can feel courage for my little baby girl. And she's like, and she's like one. Hello parents, newsflash, if your baby can't walk or talk yet, you probably can't get a good feel on her future's magical talents. Ha ha ha. 
Shoot, crash another free spell on my home mode. Ah, uh, let them talk. None of it matters to a suppose anyway. Even if you could crash the strongest magic in the world, that wouldn't mean anything if you didn't have the money to buy mana potions. I cast another fire. I cast another fire, I can't count how many times I've cast the same spell since this morning. We do get supplies of mana from the factory, but only enough for factory work. And eating food, drinking water, and even breathing air do restore some mana. But not by much. But not by much. It sucks to be poor, doesn't it? Just be thankful there are people worse off than us. Some people don't have a job, so they can't make a living at all. Why do people always do that? Always do what? Jude looks honestly puzzled by my question. Saying, be thankful, others have it worse. Why do people say, always say that? Is knowing that life can be even crappier than I thought supposed to make me feel better? What do I say here? Yup, now that I realize just how much more messed up this world is from some other people, I feel so great in comparison. Jude gawks at me with a funny expression. Like she wanted to laugh, but laughing felt wrong. She doesn't even look mad. It looked like her eyes were saying, Really, Alice? We both got quiet. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Wait. And then you laugh it off. And we change perspective yet again. I bet we're the student this time again. Oh no, we are Frederick. Huh? I sit forward with a jolt. The presenter on the podium is demonstrating some kind of magic machine. I must have nodded off. So, as you see, after I have deposited the chunks of metal into the furnace, I can simply put my hand on this pad, like this, and the f and then the furnace turns on and melts the metal. Once all the chunks have melt melted, the machine automatically transfers the liquid to a mold of your own design and absorbs all the heat from the molten metal to turn it back into solid. There is also an option to connect the machine to the next system in your assembly line, so the finished part can be delivered to the next system automatically. So basically a magic machine furnace so that we don't those workers don't need to use their magic on the machine. Wait. If they do incorporate that, wouldn't that mean that Um yeah, her name was Alice, now remember? Alice would be kicked out of the job because now they have a furnace that does it, a machine. Looking around, I see some servants pick up dirty plates from a number of tables in the conference hall. Looks like I slept through lunch. I overhear the conversation of two MM representatives who are sitting next to me. What do you think of that machine? Sounds like a great way to boost efficiency in our factories. I don't think so. It may sound that way, but there are hidden costs that we need to be aware of. First of all, we need we would need to hire technicians to maintain the machines. Then we have to train our existing workers. And who would repair the machines if they broke down? We could try repairing it up by ourselves, but that would take time. It's easier to just ask the vendor to repair them, which is why these machines usually come with yearly support contracts. Finally, when the machines reach the end of life, we would have to replace them with new ones. Frankly, I still think it's more cost effective to just hire cheap pol proletariat workers to do whatever these machines do. If the workers start being unproductive, we can easily replace them with other probes. Oh, that was a man one, not a woman. That's his voice, just imagine that's his voice. I see, well, those are good points. As I thought, these presenters are just trying to sell shit. It's not even good shit. <laughs> it's not even good shit. Oh, you. Well, that is... Eh. Looks like the demonstration has ended. The presenter leads the podium with a few assistants who are carrying his machine. The two MM representatives resume their chat. Hey, do you want to go outside for a while? Oh, yes, I do. The morning session was great, but this afternoon session is rather boring. Yeah, that second presentation this morning was especially interesting, wasn't it? Correlation between emotion ma- Wait. Correlation between emotional maturity and magical affinity? What? That's the one. All this time we've been thinking that older mages tend to be better with magic. Solely because of their experience. But maybe that's not all there is to it. Well, we don't know yet. The speaker himself noted that the fundings from his data were not yet conclusive. He even missed some control variables, as Professor Pope pointed out. Um, is that him? The guy from earlier? I mean, the other guy? The student? But his presentation reminded me of that old book, 
The Magical Minds by Dr. Shelley. Have you read it? That's the one that discussed the effect of a magician's psychological state of mind on his magic, right? Yes, I've read that one. It's a classic. It was published, what, 17 years ago? Yeah, it is. That old, isn't it? Anyway, let's go. I need smoke. The two representatives exit the hall to the balcony. They are not the only people leaving, I notice. In fact, I can see more unoccupied seats now than when I came in this morning. This is my chance to leave too. As I stand up, I hear the MC, the MC announce, introduce the next speaker. Our next presenter is a senior in the Department of Magical Science and Conservatoire de Overture who is currently doing research under the guidance of Professor Johan Poe. Ladies and gentlemen, Franz Byron. Ah yeah, his name is Franz. Remember that. Hmm, isn't he that student from before? Ahem, good morning everyone. My name is Franz Byron and I want to talk about a research project I'm working on. The title of the, th of the thesis is Study and Analy Analysis of Compassion-Based Magic and its Effect on Inorganic Matters. Compassion Magic? God, what is it with people? Let me give you some background on why I'm doing this research. We all know about magic machines. Magic machines have benefited society in innumerable ways. People nowadays can use every kind of magic to take their daily life easier. Fire magic, wind magic, water magic, earth magic, and their variants. All of these can produce, can be produced via a magic machine, as long as you supply them with mana infused with the corresponding magical traits. But we still haven't gotten a machine to process mana infused with compassion. It, it just doesn't work. Compassion magic doesn't materialize except through living beings. Machines can't cast compassion magic. Likewise, casting compas compassion magic on inanimate objects has absolutely no effect. Now, there are a lot of theories about why this phenomenon exists, but there is still no definitive answer to explain the problem. We don't know why this happens, nobody does. The effects of solving this particular problem are obvious. Compassion, compassion is an infinitely useful magic as we all know. Illumination magic, for example, is based it's based on faith and compassion. Overture still relies on illuminators to walk the streets every morning, evening to light the city. If we had a machine to do this work, much time and money could be saved. Yes, I was. I wondered that. I was like, why couldn't the machine just turn it on and like, oh, now we get it. Cause compassion. All right, cool. But the most vital compassion-based magic, quite literally, is healing magic. The first machine was invented 30 years ago, and we are now using them everywhere. Everywhere. Everywhere except in hospital and clinics. Why not? It's a healing machine, right? Healthcare would be revolutionized if you could make it into an industry with the help of magic machines. This brings us to my research. In my study, I've come across several reports of cases where inanimate objects were affected by this type of magic. For example, there was a report in the year 305 or 305 about a 7 year old girl who had managed to cast heal on her broken doll and fix it. Reports like this suggest that, in some circumstances, compassion magic can affect inanimate objects. And if that's true, the reverse is likely true as well. There are murmurs from the audience... Oh wait, I'm, I'm still federal. There are murmurs from the audience, this is quite a controversial topic at such a prestigious com symposium. Now I know what you might be thinking. There have already been numerous research studies on this, and they all failed to make compassion-based magic machines. But those experiments were done a long time ago, back when we could only determine the quality of magic from visual observation. But thanks to recent advances such as research, we now have methods to quantify magic. For example, by analyzing the water that is summoned with intelligence-based magic, we found that not all summon water, summon water is the same type of water. Some water we summon is safe to drink, some isn't. Though most water has the same consistency as what you find in the Overture River, some water will cause corrosion on metal. We now refer to the latter as acidic. Continuing research has revealed the parameters needed to quantify different properties of water. Using these parameters, we can now calculate how pure the water we summon is reliably and consistently. Still, further studies found how this purity level correlates with other magical parameters such as the magical affinity of the casters and the amount of mana used in each spell. Of course, we already knew about this correlation long before that, but at the time we had to rely 
on visual observation or other human sensory information to determine the quality of water. Now we can do it scientifically. Even before the water is cast, we can calculate it based on the caster's magical properties. Wow, so much exposition. The research that produced this result is relatively new and its results are well known, but without it, we will not be able to even now create magic machines that reliably summon drinkable water. Similar results have been achieved with willpower based magic. For example, we can now determine that type of rock that will be summoned. Discoveries like these have completely remade the construction industry. Being able to, qual to quantify magical properties means we can reduce magical science experiments to numerical data points. Simply having that data has led to innumerable advances in technology over the past generation. Still, we have never succeeded in quantifying the pros the properties of compression-based magic, this is a major part of what I will be doing for my final year project. The student goes on to explain different kinds of properties that may be analyzed from compression magic and the scientific methods to properly measure them to, qual to produce quantifiable data. To be honest, I don't give even the slightest damn. Compression magic is, as I've made remarkably clear for years now, an utter waste of effort in every theater but war. Some people in the audience seem to be listening very intensely though. I don't know why. Healing machines are a preposterous idea. If you are wounded, call a doctor to come and cast. Heal on your own. It takes, a sec it takes seconds. Finally, the student concludes his presentation. Once I collect enough data, I'll be able to analyze them to find out how compression-based magic affects different materials under different conditions. If there is a strong positive correlation, I'll be able to, to form a scientific theory on this subject. The theory will be a strong first step. My hope is that it will inspire wider research in the field of magical engineering to figure out the lingering puzzle of the compassion-based magic machine. Thank you. They are now taking some questions from the audience. I've stopped listening at this point, though there's just no way compassion magic can work to can be made to work on inanimate objects. It goes against the logic of magic. Anyone who uses magic can tell you that. It would be like burning water. Well, you can boil water. However, for some reason, I find myself thinking about his research topic, despite of, or perhaps because of, how absurd it is. Compassion. After the questions and answers session has ended, the student goes back to his seat to a warm round of applause. At the same time, the next presenter gets up from his seat and heads to the podium. But the conference hall is emptying out as the afternoon wears on. The audience has half since this morning, by my count. After a while, the presenter student also gets up from his seat and walks to the exit. Maybe I should go after him and talk for a bit. That will also give me a reason to leave the symposium. Why you need a reason? Just walk out of there if you want to walk out of there. Why you need to talk to the student? In fact, that sounds like good an idea, isn't it? I catch up to him outside the conference hall. Excuse me. Oh, hi. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Frederick Godwin. I'm here as a representative from Magical, Magical Mechanical. He smiles his gate for a second after hearing my name. Godwin is a name that carries weight in this town, thanks to my father, Geoff Godwin, the founder of MM. It's very nice to meet you, Lord Godwin. I'm Franz Byron, a Magical Science student at, the con at this conservatoire. I... Think we ran into each other this morning? Lord Godwin is what people call my father. You can just call me by my first name. The student looks startled, but soon regains his composure. Is that really okay? <laughs> Alright, nice to meet you, Frederick. I was being polite, you damn peasant. He should at least have the good sense to continue to use my title despite my offer. What a little imbecile. Oh, what? You offered <laughs> and then... Ah. Uh... Oh well, that's just you. Ahem. I was wondering why you picked compassion magic as your research topic. And our research perspective. Why did I pick compassion magic as my research topic? Excellent question. I was wondering about that myself. My research is quite unusual, I admit. A magic that can work with compassion magic? Wait, a machine that can work with compassion magic? Or a machine on which compassion magic will have an effect? Unbelievable. Here there was a report of a kid fixing her door with heel. So what? I wish somebody would have pointed out the obvious. That's what is known as anecdotal evidence. 
in layman term, unscientific. Well, unscientific is not technically a layman's term, but my point is that it is crazy to form a hypothesis based on unverified reports. I mean, the first machine was invented three decades ago, and for three decades we've known that machines don't work with compassion. It's not as if during these three decades, our best scientists haven't been trying to make them do. The only, re the only reason I'm doing the research, of course, is because Professor Poe pushed it onto me. I really had no choice. He's one of the most respected and brilliant minds in magical science. You don't say no to Professor Poe. Gosh, however am I going to graduate? Oi, you. Ah, sorry, I was lost in thought. Well, like I said in, my, in the presentation, scientific knowledge of compassion magic will have the potential to unlock all kinds of recent inventions like compassion magic machines. Speaking of magic machines, I suddenly realized that something important. I'm speaking to an MM representative, and he just so happens to be the son of Lord Godwin. MM and Lord Godwin give the most funding to research projects, especially those that may, might make money for MM. If I can convince this guy that my research can become the basis of MM's future products, I may receive a research grant. If, if we can successfully build compassion magic machines, we'll be able to revolutionize the medical industry. Imagine this. Wounds that are easily treatable with a machine, medical equipment for hospitals, the whole experience of health healthcare modernized. We might even be able to make medical equipment that can treat diseases rather than just ease pain. Now time to go for the kill. In fact, it would be a huge benefit to MNG bottom line if they could get into the healthcare business. They might even speed things up by funding my research. Ha <laughs> I don't think Fedger is gonna like this. I stop talking and wait for a reaction while observing Frederick's face. He's not gonna be amused. No reaction. Maybe I was being too obtuse. I mean, she always thinking that if maybe we could talk about how my research could benefit MM in some way, that might be... Yes, I think it's interesting. Excellent. Now I can talk about getting my research funding. Really? You think it's interesting or are you just saying that? Well, good luck on your final year project. Talk to you later. Wait, what? W wait I stopped Frederick from walking away. Yep, he's not interested, he's just being polite. Well, I was thinking, will you have time to talk, to talk more about this? I have lots of ideas that I'd like to run by you. His eyeballs twitch, his lips are pressed tightly together. Yep, he's not amused. I don't have the authority at MM to prove funds for research projects. I'm only here because my father, Lord Godwin, wanted me to attend a symposium. I... I see. Well, can you introduce me to someone who normally deals with research projects? No. He turns and walks away from me. Ah, uh, um, is there? He turns to me again, his eyes wide and lips pursed, like he just discovered a dog pooping on his front yard. Wait, I think I switched voice a bit there. But suddenly he smiles, I feel that something is wrong here, but then again, everyone smiles differently. Actually, there is somebody you can talk to regarding your research. He puts his hand into his pocket and takes out a crumpled piece of paper. Just go to that address. Cool. You are sending him to a hotel. Why? Why? I think he's just trolling. Yeah, he just want one. You're just getting rid of that paper, and you just want him off your back. And plus, you're trolling him, right? I read the address on the paper. I don't recognize the street name. Oh, thank you very much. Who should I speak with when I get there? Um, ask for my dad. You know what? Ask for Mrs. Beauvoir. Mrs. Beauvoir will be able to help you out. <laughs> oh my god, I think I like your troll so much. Got it. Thank you very much, Frederick. His eyebrows twitch again. Did I pronounce his name wrong? Don't mention it. He walks away. He doesn't look like he'll be coming back. Well, in fact, I don't have anything to do here either. Professor Poe has already given me permission to go home after I'm done with my pr presentation. I look at the piece of paper I got from Frederick. I don't recognize the street name, but I know the district. It's a bit far near the outskirts of Overture, but I can get there by omnibus. Maybe I should pay this Mrs. Beauvoir a visit. Oh boy. <laughs> there aren't many students outside because most of them are still in class. I actually don't see a Rita anyway. Isn't she on the symposium too, like presenting her calculator? The sun is still high, looking at my chronometer, 
I learned that there's still more than 2 hours until the sun sets. I should be able to arrive at my destination before the end of the day. Shortly after I cross the street and the omnibus comes, at this hour the omnibus is nearly empty, even this close to the city centre. The commute looks more than an hour, but I'm finally close to the place I'm looking for. Now I just need to find the place. I look for street signs, as soon as I find one, I walk over to it. Unfortunately, there are no signs that bear the street name written on the paper. But there is one that sounds similar, I try going that way. I plot from sign street to street sign. Wait, I plot from street sign to street sign. Almost everything is unreliable at times, I have to double back on and try different ways. After wondering for who knows how long, I find that it's almost sundown. I walk, I'm walking along a river, a stone thrown, a stone thrown away from a big curved bridge that crosses the water. I head to the bridge and cross it. Yep, you're nearing the place. After arriving at the other end, I realize that I've entered in this part of the city. I continue strolling through a road that gets narrower with every block I pass. It's also getting dark or rather gloomy. Has the sun totally set? I look around and catch a glimpse of a man in shabby clothing. Sitting on the dusty pavement near an intersection, his back rested against the wall of a dirty looking bookstore. I avoid directing my gaze at him, but as I walk past him, I notice he's missing an arm. In fact, both of them. A feeling of pity for this man wells up in me. I now know why he's sitting on the pavement without hands. It is possible to cast magic. Without magic, wait, without hands, it is impossible to cast magic. Without magic, it is impossible to have any reasonable expectation of a good life. In this society, people like him are the lowest of the low. However small they may be in number, there are the sole level of society that exists without hope. I would sooner die than be like him. May the gods have mercy on him. Seeing this amputee makes me understand where I actually am. This must be a proletariat district. That means why, that explains why ev everything looks dreary, smells noxious and feels unclean. Why am I in a post district? Did I get the address wrong? Finally I find a sign that bears the street name. I'm looking for, I follow the sign. You found the place! Here it is, this is the address written on the paper. The house is big and luxurious, but it's not what I expected. I double check and triple check the address, but this is really it. The name of Mrs. Beauvoir is even written above the door. Mission de Beauvoir. What is this place? This is definitely not an ordinary house. Should I knock on the door? A dirty looking man starts to talk to me as he walks by. Are you a first timer? What are you waiting for? Don't be embarrassed. We all know this place. Just go on inside. Ha ha ha. Excuse me? The best girls are only available later at night, but you'll be able to find someone to shoot you even now. What are you talking about? Don't pretend, boy. You are here to have fun with a girl, right? Or maybe you just want to see some tits. They might let you for look for free if you pretend you're lost. Ha ha ha. No, I'm not here for that. Realizing what kind of place it is, I quickly turn and walk away. Frederick Godwin, why did he do this to me? Sure, he might have been annoyed because I asked for funding, but he didn't have to make me come all the way out here out of spite. My heart is beating fast. Uh, it, be, it would have been really funny if that if he didn't met that man, he just knocked on the door and she's like, Why, hello there, young man, and he's still clueless. <laughs> now, how do I get back to the city? I try to retrace my steps quickly, but I don't hate pools, but that doesn't mean I fancy being around them. Soon I'm lost. Each corner looks as dirty, dark, and decrepit as, as the last. Nothing stories me as familiar. As intersections I now, at intersections, I now pick roads purely by instinct. I, my only clue being that roads near the city are supposed to be wider, following the reasoning, at last I come across an open white area with white road. Unlike the dark alleys in the slum, this place is bathed in orange light from the setting sun. I'm relieved to have found my way back to the city, thanks my, thank my intelligence. Except the place doesn't look like the city at all, if anything, it is even more rural. I walk some more before spotting a site on which stands a number of large old buildings, from it comes the sound of machinery, of labour and of magic being cast. But I think that is a good place to end it. So leave a like, comment and subscribe and follow me on Twitter at DMindGaming if you have enjoyed and I hope to see you again in the next episode.